Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Shared Decision-Making in Radiology, How Should Patients and Physicians Discuss the Imaging Cost of Care? Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select Telephone in the audio pane, and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of your control panel. You may send in your question at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end. I would now like to introduce our moderator, Sarah Krug. Welcome to our second Participatory Medicine Learning Exchange. I am Sarah Krug. I'm the Executive Director of the Society for Participatory Medicine. I'm also the uh, CEO of the Cancer 101 Foundation and founder of the Health Collaboratory. And it's an honor to partner with the American College of Radiology to discuss an important topic, shared decision making and imaging. How should patients and physicians discuss the cost of care? Next slide, please. Now, before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SPM and the history behind the Learning Exchange. As many of you know, uh, or may know, participatory medicine is a movement in which network patients shift from being mere passengers to uh, responsible drivers of their health, and in which providers encourage and value them as full partners. SPM's mission is to catalyze collaborative partnerships across the continuum of care to optimize health and health care. The Society's foundation is based upon four pillars, which include uh, community building, where our goal is to stimulate awareness and foster collaboration among all stakeholders, uh, advocacy and policy, where our goal is to advocate for policies that support the core premise of participatory medicine. Uh, research, where our goal is to cultivate forums for the exchange of research data, ideas uh, regarding the adoption of participatory medicine. And lastly, education, where our goal is to develop and disseminate uh, resources, tools, uh, curricula that encourage the adoption of participatory medicine practices. Now, these goals were created as a result of extensive interviews with our members and other key stakeholders within the community. And the beauty of these goals is that many of you are already out there working on these pillars and advancing participatory medicine in your day-to-day -day work. Um, next slide, please. Now, the Learning Exchange was created to help you showcase that work. Understanding the work we're conducting in our individual silos can help us uh, learn from one another, allow us to build upon ideas, forge collaborations, uh, provide a forum for feedback and suggestions, and hopefully avoid duplication of efforts. So the learning exchange really allows us to also capture how we're collectively moving the needle. Next slide. Now it's an honor to introduce our partner in producing this webinar, the American College of Radiology. I'd like to give a special shout out to Ms. Becky Haynes uh, from the ACR who is instrumental in helping us coordinate this webinar behind the scenes. Uh, ACR is a corporate sponsor of SPM and recently published a recommended article in SPM's new newsletter entitled Radiology and Participatory Medicine, which is based on the December 2016 um, Journal of the American College of Radiology issue on patient and family-centered care. Now, our ACR representative, uh, Dr. Hotkins, will give us a um, brief overview of the ACR, and you'll be learning more about his work in today's session. Thanks, Sarah, and I will absolutely be brief and certainly appreciate you including uh, us from the from the college as part of this effort. Uh, and it's totally true. This is all of this is due to to Becky Haynes. I, I'm merely the spokesman. Um, I am one member of the American College of Radiology. We are a 36,000 member organization. Um, we represent diagnostic radiologists, interventional radiologists, nuclear medicine physicians, and radiation oncologists uh, across the United States. Um, perhaps. Uh, more excitingly to this audience, uh, our, our most recent commission within the organization is what we've entitled the, the Patient and Family Centered Care Commission, uh, centered on incorporating patients not only into the care cycle, but uh, we also have committee works focused on uh, quality as it relates to imaging, informatics uh, as it relates to the, to the patient experience and other things, and every committee within that commission uh, does have pa patient representation. Uh, with a goal of expanding that to the rest of our commissions across the college. Uh, we are the entity that sets the uh, practice parameters for practices across the United States to follow, uh, and we have a, the, the gold standard for imaging accreditation programs uh, in the United States. So that gives you a little bit of background about us, but again, uh, we're 
we feel very privileged from the college to be with you guys today. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Uh, next slide, please. So we have a packed agenda where we plan to set the foundation with the issues many of us are aware of related to the costs of care. Uh, we'll then share tips, resources, best practices that can empower you to make informed decisions as you discuss and understand the relative benefits and costs of diagnostic imaging. Uh, we'll then open it up to you, our audience, for questions, but feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation uh, through the uh, question box on your panel. Next slide. So I'd like to kick off the webinar by introducing our speakers. Uh, you just heard from Dr. Hawkins, who's a pediatric interventional radiologist and assistant professor at Emory University School of Medicine. We also have Dr. Emily Ganos, who's the program officer at Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Go to the next slide, please. I'd like to also introduce uh, Andrea Barandi Kitts, who's the lung cancer and patient advocate as well as a consultant. Um, she's with Leahy Hospital and Medical Center and the University of Connecticut Health Center. We also have Jennifer Coleman, who is the executive director at Grand Traverse Radiologists. Next slide, please. And none of our speakers have any conflict of interest to disclose. Okay, so I'd like to hand it off to Dr. Emmy Ganos, who's going to talk to us about why cost conversations are so important. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Emmy Ganos, and um, I'm a program officer at Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, I'm going to set the stage today by talking for just a few minutes about cost of care conversations in general, some of the barriers to having cost conversations, and some opportunities to make it easier to have productive conversations about costs. So first, why are cost conversations important anyway? We know that talking about costs is important to patients. A 2015 survey from Kaiser Family Foundation found that 42% of Americans reported that it's somewhat or very difficult to afford health services. That same survey found that most Americans believe that making price information available should be a top healthcare priority. And several surveys have also reported that most patients say that they want to have opportunities to discuss cost of care during medical visits with their healthcare provider. An overwhelming majority of providers, too, report that managing patient costs is an important aspect of their work. Increasingly, providers are reporting that managing costs is a part of their professional responsibility. Cost conversations can help patients to seek out financial assistance earlier on in their care and can help patients to avoid having to make trade-offs or to cut corners in ways that might be detrimental to their health. Plus, healthcare providers are increasingly playing a role in managing total cost of care for populations. Cost conversations are also an opportunity to deliver better care. Conversations can improve adherence to jointly developed care plans. Um, it can lead to time savings when treatment plans don't need to be altered due to costs. And cost conversations can even be an opportunity for providers to build trust with their patients by demonstrating empathy and caring and asking about cost burdens and then working to reduce costs when it's possible for a given patient's treatment. Even though there are several benefits to cost conversations, we're all aware that neither patients or clinicians are fully equipped for cost conversations right now. Barriers on the clinician side include few established best practices for having cost conversations, a lack of tools, information, or awareness of costs, time pressure, discomfort in having cost conversations, and lack of options for reducing costs for patients. On the patient side, Patients may be concerned that talking with their doctor won't help to reduce costs, or they may worry that mentioning costs will lead them to them receiving lower quality care. When seeking information on their own, studies show that patients have challenges accessing and using price transparency tools. And importantly, many patients report high levels of distrust in the healthcare system overall, and conversations about cost can be especially difficult in that context. But ready or not, cost conversations are already here. RWJF funded a study by Wynn Hunter and Peter Eubel, which examined transcripts from over 1,700 outpatient visits. This study found that 30% of outpatient visits contained cost conversations. Nearly half of those conversations involved some discussion of cost-saving strategies that patients could employ or that involved changing care plans. When these cost-saving strategies were discussed, it typically didn't take very long. The median time was only 68 seconds. And two-thirds of the time, cost conversations took overall less than a minute. 
So in this context, it's important for us to remember that cost conversations aren't really a matter of if, but more a matter of when. When cost conversations happen, how can we make sure that they're as helpful as possible? And what would it take to encourage more and more productive cost conversations? So at Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we've been working with Avalier Health to help to get our arms around this topic. We worked with Avalier to conduct key informant interviews, which resulted in this five-part framework describing what's needed to make progress on cost conversations. I'd like to walk through just a couple of these areas in a bit more depth. So whenever the topic of cost conversations comes up, one of the first places that people's minds go to is to tools. Since most physicians don't have ready access to cost information, tools can help to address that problem. There are a growing number of tools on the market that provide price transparency, such as through insurance company websites, employer tools like Castlight, or freestanding tools like Amino or GoodRx. However, when tools do exist, they're rarely customizable or individualized. They don't include an individual patient's out-of-pocket cost and what that might be, or whether that patient's met their deductible already, or any other individualized information about the type of decision being made or about their care. So it's important to note that tools are best if they can be used in the context of shared decision making. A tool is much better if health professionals can provide important clinical context that applies to the type of decision being made and to provide guidance for patients. Yet the variety of tools is growing by the day, and while it's complex, the technical capability does exist to get personalized and customized information at the point of care. We just haven't really gotten the push to get those tools uh, fully made and fully integrated into people's workflows and into their electronic medical record systems. While tools create technical challenges, the adaptive challenges of engagement are in some ways even more complex. In addition to the information needs and time pressures, perhaps the biggest barrier is that talking about money with patients can be very awkward. It can be awkward to talk about money if there's a difference in socioeconomic status between the patient and the provider. Sometimes there's not much that can be done to lower an out-of-pocket cost, and providers may not be comfortable raising, the, raising that question if there's not an easy solution. And it can be especially uncomfortable for providers when the costs being discussed aren't the costs from some third-party entity, like a drug company, but costs that affect your own organization's bottom line. These factors can all make it harder to raise the topic. But of course, avoiding these discussions doesn't do anyone any favors either. The bill for services is going to come either way, whether you have the conversation with your patient or not. And avoiding these topics or failing to display concern about this element of decision making can have poor consequences for the doctor-patient relationship as well. So no matter how thorny those engagement barriers might be, there are some promising opportunities as well. First, as we learned, cost conversations are already widespread and cost conversations are increasingly recognized as important. There are absolutely some best practices that are available today, such as best practices about empathic communication and having difficult conversations. Many shared decision-making resources also include some cost information as part of a larger context when, preventing, when presenting options. And choosing wisely materials can be helpful as well for avoiding costs associated with unnecessary care. One especially important um, opportunity that I want to touch on is the growth of team-based care. Some conversations, especially those that will change care plans, really do need the involvement of a physician. But the totality of the cost discussion doesn't have to be on a physician's shoulders all the time. In many cases, there are others on the care team who can address different types of questions and use different cost reduction strategies. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there's new research forthcoming. RWJF is sponsoring, sponsoring research on best practices for optimizing cost conversations between clinicians and patients who are members of vulnerable populations to really get at the engagement and language barriers that, that can hold back conversations. We're expecting to publish findings in early 2018. The last area of our infographic that I want to discuss with you is clinical workflow. Clearly, it's not enough to have tools and best practices for engagement if approaches can't be fully embedded into clinical workflows. We're seeing some promising opportunities related to workflow too. Increasingly, practices are experimenting with embedding cost tools into electronic health records. And more practices are incorporating financial questions into routine visit activities. And as we discussed, employing a team-based approach can make workflow integration much more feasible. At RWJF, we're studying some examples of 
of workflow integration, such as nurses incorporating cost conversations into medication reconciliation processes, examples of practices using financial navigators in more complex cases like cancer care, and doing some studies of integration of cost tools into clinical workflow. Again, we're expecting findings from these studies in early 2018. Through our work in this area, I've come to a few conclusions that I'd like to share with you now. The first is that cost of care is an important component in shared decision making. Patients absolutely care about this, and while we don't want anyone to have to make decisions based solely on costs, we're also not doing anyone any favors by avoiding the conversation or by pretending that costs aren't part of the realities that patients are facing when they make decisions about their care. Even for patients with high levels of financial means, many patients want to talk about cost reduction strategies, either to avoid wasting their own money or to reduce costs overall, since of course we all pay these costs through our health insurance premiums and through our taxes. But of course, cost is not the be all end all for patients either. Costs need to be weighed with patient preferences and clinical evidence so that patients can get the care that's right for them. Thirdly, it's critical for patients to get support. It's not really shared decision making if patients are on their own for the financial element of decision making. And clinical care teams are ideally situated to help patients to understand their options and to adapt and to adapt care plans when appropriate, utilizing the full care team as much as possible. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we must keep in, in mind that cost only matters if a treatment or test is truly necessary and appropriate for a given patient. Any price is too high for unnecessary care. So thanks so much for this opportunity to talk a bit about this topic. I'll look forward to the questions and answers at the end of the webinar. And for now, I'll turn the floor over to Sarah Krug. Thank you, Dr. Ganos. Uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, Becky Haynes from the ACR has shared a few of the resources discussed with you in the chat function, so take a look. Uh, but we'll also uh, circulate them after the webinar along with the archived recording. So next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Matt Hopkins, who is the uh, Assistant Professor of Pediatric Radiology uh, at Emory University School of Medicine, and he's going to talk to us about current strategies in clinical practice. Okay, thank you, Sarah, and we can go ahead and advance to the to the next slide. So I was asked to join uh, this webinar in particular to give a, a physician's perspective on, um, on how these conversations take place, what uh, what knowledge gaps exist, uh, and at least my perspective on how I handle them. I, I do dabble in this space quite a bit as far as cost and health services research, and I probably should say that before I get, for anyone that does want more in-depth information into uh, cost, the cost of care, particularly related to interventional radiology, which, which is my specialty. I, I think Becky is going to post a link uh, to a presentation that I give on that. But not to get into the weeds and the wonky health policy uh, stuff, uh, let's just talk about the basics. Um, again, I'm a pediatric interventional radiologist uh, here in Atlanta at Emory, uh, and it certainly poses some interesting and, and unique clinical scenarios because, yes, while my patients can be uh, from every, as old as one day up to 21 years old, so often uh, the conversations, the clinical conversations, particularly with the younger kids, take place with parents who happen to be my age. And I, as Emmy has alluded to, cost conversations have become increasingly more common, and I have them often uh, in my clinic, particularly with the advent of, of high deductible of high deductible care, and uh, excuse me, high deductible health plans. And so, to start with strategies and the conversations that I have with with my patients, the, the number one thing that I always talk about, and again in the modern era of high deductible health plans, is the time of year and how urgent is whatever imaging study uh, or procedure that we may need to do. How urgent does this need to be done? And what do I mean by that? Um, one of the abnormalities or disease processes that I specialize in is, is vascular anomalies, so arterial venous malformations, venous malformations, lymphatic malformations. And uh, this is a group of, uh, of diseases that children are born with, live with over time. They do cause lots of problems and need to be treated, but rarely, rarely, rarely do we need to treat them tomorrow or the next week. And so it's very common when I meet people in late in the year, October, November, December, where we will talk about deductibles. And the reason is, of course, if we if we start the care process and go down the line of an MRI and then uh, and an embolization or two or and maybe a follow-up MRI if needed. As you all know, on, on 
on the on the webinar. If you meet your deductible in 2016, you you know you start back at zero at 2017, and so the you may need to meet your deductible twice for the same disease process rather than once. And of course, with high deductible plans for families now getting as high as four, five, six thousand uh, dollars, if you can pay five thousand dollars to treat something rather than ten thousand uh, dollars, particularly if it's not urgent, that's something that's vitally important. And um, the counter to that is there are other families and children where we've been treating them throughout the year and uh, sometimes they're very close to being cured or perhaps they need to get that follow-up uh, imaging to confirm cure uh, and so December has become an exceedingly busy month for us um, because usually folks have met their deductibles and we certainly do everything we can in our power uh, to close the loop of, of care uh, if we can within that calendar year. Uh, this is this is in contradistinction to how it used to be but when I was in training before the advent of high deductible health care plans. Um, December was a slow month. Nobody wanted to get anything done around the holidays, and you could bet that clinics, particularly outpatient clinics and outpatient procedure areas, uh, were very, very slow. So this is completely flipped on its head. Now, what are the challenges as a physician to discussing to discussing care? And, uh, you know, Emmy talked about some of certainly the socioeconomic challenges, and, and there are there are situations where certainly I do everything I can to not make an uncomfortable situation feel uncomfortable. Um, but the socio demographic differences between uh, with, with some of my patients, you can't pretend they don't exist. So there certainly are some um, things to overcome there. I think Emmy nailed it on the head what some of the challenges are. But I'll talk about from a policy standpoint. Um, uh, many people on, on the webinar probably heard about the hospital charge masters and how hospitals charge these ridiculous prices and the prices that they charge have nothing to do with the actual cost of care. Um, and the reason they do that, uh, and whether it's right or wrong, I, I, I won't speculate, but the reason they do that, they have different proprietary negotiated payments with every different insurer that they work with. So I work at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, so we do a lot of work with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Georgia and Aetna and WellCare and Medicare and Medicaid and have different negotiated prices for all the things that we do. And a certain procedure may cost thousands and thousands of dollars, while some payers may only pay, let's say, $1,000. There are still a lot of payers that will pay 80 or 85 percent of total charges. And so even though some insurers will pay a very small amount, there are others that still pay very high amounts that offset the lower paying insurers. And so hospitals, I don't know where they are artificially, but they inflate the overall charges uh, for that reason. And uh, it's obviously getting worse and worse as more payers pay fewer and fewer for the services uh, that are being provided. As you can imagine, that just leaves physicians uh, in the dark. Uh, with what the actual cost of care is. When people ask me how much an MRI costs, I sort of have to shrug my shoulders uh, and start with, you know, what's your insurance? Have you met your deductible already? Um, and then we can start getting in the ballpark of what a cost might be, but very, very difficult because I certainly don't know what the proprietary negotiated contract is uh, with our hospital and with, with their insurance. The other challenge is uh, understanding indirect costs of care when that factor into the actual care delivered. Uh, indirect cost of care are everything from the parking garage at a hospital to um, the, the real estate space that it takes to, to offer our services. Uh, and a lot of that tends to be estimated in the, when hospitals estimate the cost that it takes to deliver care. Uh, there have been some studies that have been done out of multiple institutions showing that by doing uh, time-derived activity-based costing rather than estimating with indirect costs, uh, that we highly, highly overestimate the indirect costs of care uh, with these with these charges. And if you want to get really practical with it, um, indirect costs of care are a total nightmare. We start looking at differences in real estate costs. Um, you know, uh, real estate in rural Arkansas, where you might be able to get an MRI, is uh, obviously much, much cheaper than real estate in Manhattan, where you can get the same MRI, but the cost of that care uh, vary dramatically uh, because of the indirect costs associated with that. So those are a couple of the big, big gaps that even for those of us that, you know, again, dabble in this space and care about this, um, limit the accuracy of the information we can provide for our patients. But I'm very open about it, and I have these discussions often.
often, and I think it's important for all of us to continue to move in that direction. Um, the, the last point I'll make um, is just the, just the doggone huge knowledge gap that is there with most physicians in the actual cost of care. And I will cite one study that we did here at Emory. Uh, we, we surveyed all of the radiology trainees, so all of our residents uh, across the United States. Uh, over a thousand residents returned uh, these surveys. And what we asked was, what is the cost of five basic imaging studies? Chest X-ray, non-contrast, head CT, MR of the spine, uh, ultrasound of the abdomen, and I'm forgetting what the fifth one was, but very basic. We do these all the time studies, and we asked them what the estimated cost was using the Medicare physician fee schedule as a surrogate. Um, over a thousand responses. These are people that do imaging all day, every day. It's their life, their residence, and 17.1% uh, of responses were within 25% of the actual, actual cost. Uh, so physicians have no idea what insurers are paying for these. Uh, they're nowhere in the ballpark of what the actual um, dollars exchanged are for these. So we have a long way to go there, but we're doing a number of things on a national level to make sure that our trainees learn about cost and care about cost moving forward. And hopefully not only um, by educating our residents a little bit better, um, that's only part of it. Hopefully our hospitals will continue to, to improve the resources that are available to physicians to understand uh, the cost of care as it relates to uh, what our patients are having to pay. So with that, I will go ahead and turn this over to, to Ms. Jennifer Coleman. Uh, Ms. Coleman is the Executive Director uh, from not too far from my old stomping grounds up, up in Michigan of the uh, Grand Traverse Radiology Group. Uh, Jennifer, go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, I come at it from a slightly different perspective in that I've had the distinct pleasure of working on almost every side of the equation in healthcare from um, hospitals, from academics to private actually working for the hospital associations um, as well as on the provider side and currently work with the fantastic group in Traverse City of radiologists, 20 strong. And I also work for a healthcare insurance company. And so my perspective today is to try to tie all those pieces together and give you a look kind of behind the scenes on cost, but also the prior authorization process related to imaging services. So with that on the next slide, please. I don't want to get too into the woods, but what does it take to get an authorization? So typically authorizations are going to happen in the outpatient elective arena, and those authorizations are going to be in the form of high-tech imaging services such as MRIs, CTs, and the like. So I want to spend a little bit of time today giving you an understanding of what happens as a patient, as a provider of service with that process, and then also looking at clinical decision support as a potential uh, tool being used in some areas and will be used in 2018 by Medicare instead of a prior authorization approach to help manage costs but also get the discussion around appropriate care um, more um, relevant and being used in the marketplace on a much higher level. On the next slide, please. So we've had a great background on you know cost uh, patients providers working along all of this, and I, I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about the relationships. So we have a relationship between a patient and an insurance company that says, I am going to pay you a premium for a set number of services, and they have an agreement on what they cover, what they don't cover, what their co-pays, deductibles are, etc. Then you have a distinct relationship between payers and the providers, whether it's a hospital or a physician or a nurse practitioner, for a number of services and what they're going to pay you to do those services. And then you have your relationship between your physician or provider and the patient. And they come to see the provider, and the provider delivers the services they feel are appropriate for the patient and the indications that they have. It's very hard for all three of those because they are distinct, unique relationships with distinct arrangements in them to know what all those arrangements are. And to the point earlier, we, we rarely know what a deductible is or a specific plan design is for that patient because they change annually, if not more frequently. And there's so many intricacies being um, brought in on the health insurance side, it's very difficult even for the patient to understand what package they bought and what the coverage is. So back in the day when I was working on the health plan side, I was asked to work with them in bringing on a prior authorization or a pre-authorization process for imaging. It was 
geared at outpatient high tech, so MRIs and CTs, um, nuclear medicine, and PET scans. And the reason was that they needed to really manage those costs and also those, the utilization. And that made sense. They were responsible for delivering care, and they had set premiums, and they wanted to make sure that they were being responsible with those dollars and they were paying for appropriate services. Unfortunately, there were a number of unrealized or unintended consequences that came out of it. And in our particular community, when this was brought in, we had a, a threat of physicians saying they didn't want to participate with the plan any longer, that if they were having to jump through these hoops, they knew what they wanted for the patient, they knew what was best for the patient, and they felt that this was um, a burden that was not worth it to them to be a member of that or a panel for that plan any longer. It also then had an impact on access, because if we had a panel of providers leave, then we didn't have a way to take care of our patients, and there was disruption in care. There were also increased administrative burdens, so those providers had to figure out how they were going to get these approvals done and who was going to do it in the office place. It negatively impacted the workflow, and it was very much a one-size-fits-all. So it was using algorithms that were typically at that time on paper, and it was one-size-fits-all for this type of patient who shows up. It was very hard to individualize those approaches, working with a third party on the outside. There was an unintended consequence of workarounds. So people, if they knew they had to go through the hoop, they might not order it if they really should have ordered it on a timely basis. Or they might have figured out a way to get around ordering it. Or they might have said, you know what, go over to the ER because you can get that service and you don't have to get a prior authorization to, to uh, get it approved. And there were limited measurements of how well we were doing. It was really focused on cost utilization. Again, if you look on the left-hand side of the chart, there's nothing there talking about quality or appropriate care because it, we didn't have the ability to really look at that at that time. We could look at how much was it costing and how many were we doing. And it was much more of a punitive jump through a hoop process as opposed to educational. And on the next slide, it did one other thing that really had an impact as we look back. It reduced the communication between our providers. And in particular, before radiology business management companies existed, the ordering provider would talk with the radiologist, who was the expert in the field, and come up with the imaging plan for the patient. After the entrance of, of having a prior authorization process in place, it was the ordering provider talking to that vendor, maybe, maybe not having a conversation with the radiologist, not just with the vendor, but even locally, that radiologist wasn't always in that conversation for that imaging plan. So in an era where we're trying to improve communication across the entire industry, it really was working against us continue to have that great dialogue between those people looking for imaging to help them decide what's the best next step for their patient and that radiologist who was the expert in that particular area of care to be in that conversation. One of the things that our group does is that we want to make sure that the tests are done appropriately and at the right time and have all the right information. So the group actually reviews those exams that come through on the outpatient side before we go ahead and provide the service. So several days in advance, they go through to see what the orders are, and they make sure we have all the pertinent information, like what's really going on with the patient. They might identify questions that they have for the ordering provider. They'll look at lab values, if those are important for the particular test that's being done. And then they'll also make sure that the patient doesn't have any implants or metal in their body if they're, for example, going to have an MRI. They want to have all that worked out so if the patient arrives, we're not disrupting the care and making and having them go back or telling them we can't do the exam that day. Part of that equation now is also having that prior auth. So we have to have all the clinical information, all the questions answered, but also that magical number that makes sure that when the service is delivered, that patient doesn't receive a bill at their house afterwards that's a surprise, that they didn't think was coming, that they thought the service was covered, whatever that might be. Next slide, please. So here, you have to get your glasses out, is a very good example of a grid that we actually use in our area. And our area is a small market. So we're in northern Michigan. We have a handful of dominant providers, lots of Medicare Advantage plans, though. And all of these providers tend to have slightly different rules about what requires an authorization. So <laughs> when somebody shows up or gets scheduled for a service, Somebody pulls this grid out, and they look at it, and they say, OK, let's see. You're on row four, item six, uh, plan design 
you know, 17, and they try to figure out what rule set they have to follow. It's very complex and it's ever changing. So there always has to be somebody that's monitoring this and updating it because it does change. Um, the other day I got another notice of items being added in for our Blue Care Network program. So with that, it's very difficult, again, to know precisely what was required in the first place. And if you got that right, understanding what the cost was with that service for that patient so that we're giving them good information before they have their service done. Uh, we want to reduce surprises. And we want to make sure everybody understands, is this covered? How is it going to be covered before that service is rendered, not after the fact? On the next slide, I'm going to demonstrate to you the common workflow. Again, get your glasses out a little bit. You don't have to read the boxes, but the point is that it is not simplistic. We have tried to simplify this workflow several times and keep saying, well, if we just did it right on the front end, we could avoid all of these other steps. The problem is we Without a real-time tool in place, it's very difficult to get it right on the front end without having to go back and correct steps later. So in the example I gave you before, where we're reviewing cases as they're coming in on the outpatient side, if somebody was scheduled to have an MRI with contrast and we determined that they couldn't handle the contrast and we needed to go without contrast, so let's say they, they had a bad lab value that came back with that, we'd have to start over potentially and get a new authorization started for that patient. So they may have already gone through, gotten all their approvals, but when it comes down to the day that they need their study or two days before, we realize that we really have to change it and not deliver contrast for clinical reasons. That's a typical thing that can happen. There's always processes in place with each plan that differs slightly that says, well, when that happens, you have 48 hours to let us know and we can work through this process, but it requires rework, more people touching it, and um, very complicated. And what we want to make sure, again, is at the end of the day, we didn't drop the ball with that authorization that resulted in either a patient having a higher cost or having it not covered all, at all. When we move down to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about how these costs have shifted. So when we started, these costs were really borne by the health plans. And when they introduced the preauthorization process, the payers were paying a fee, and it's typically in the order of a per member per month charged, and they pay a radiology business management firm, and there's several out there, to manage that utilization. So that's the place that reviews the orders and makes sure everything is in, in line and decides whether or not that CT should be given or not. It's also the place that if they don't like the answer, the providers call and make an appeal. So there are clinical staff that are located there for those types of um, inquiries as well. And in addition to that, we've ended up giving some additional administrative costs to the providers that have to spend their time or their staff time on getting these things done in advance. And then we've also added some unintended costs to the patients. And that comes in the form of potentially delays in care because they're waiting for that approval, or there might be a canceled exam. So imagine you've driven an hour, in our case, to have an exam and then you find out when you get there you're not able to fulfill that. We don't want that to happen. We rarely let that happen. We go ahead anyways. But then you're chasing again that workflow on the back end. We really should be having a conversation on the front end that talks about if it's appropriate and the patient needs it and the clinicians have looked at this and decided that's appropriate, we should all have this information flow nicely um, so that at the end of the day we do the right test at the right time in the right place. Next slide, please. So what's been very nice is an entrance of clinical decision support in the area of imaging. This has happened in other arenas, but it, for imaging, we now have the ability to move away from paper process and paper understanding of, of why things should be done for the right reasons. And we have some technology tools that allow us to do things in real time. And this has been great. If this had only been in place back in the day when we did prior off, I don't think we ever would have gone down that route because this is a much more simplistic straightforward um, process, and we'll go over it a little bit. It's a much more collaborative approach, so it's really looking at the patient and the physician can actually have dialogue in their office about what they're going to do, and, and the tool can actually be used, and I'll give an example in a little bit about how we did it in a pilot with the patient sitting there and part of that conversation. Gives positive feedback from providers um, that have used it. When we did a pilot up here, we got some very positive uh, feedback, which I'll share with you can be done in real time, so it's not after the fact. It's not it's while you're sitting in the office. You sit down and you go over what's needed, and the provider can actually make a decision right there and know that it's going to move forward. 
it's focused on appropriateness, not just cost. They can have discussions about cost and relative radiation and those types of things in that dialogue, but it's not just focused on cost. It also looks at what is the right test for that patient given their clinical conditions. It includes evidence basis for recommendations, and you actually have an area in most tools that you can display this evidence. That means you can go out and look at the actual studies that support why or why you wouldn't do an MRI for low back pain at a particular time or with particular conditions presenting. And that's very helpful to share with those patients because a lot of times they're patients that have chronic conditions that feel that imaging is, they've got to get an image done because they've had this condition for so long, may very well need to be, but you can have that conversation and share the information and the evidence behind it for those cases that are maybe more difficult and maybe those cases that say, we're not going to do imaging quite yet and here's why. It includes follow-up recommendations in those tools. So we do a study. We can also identify when you need to come back and for what. And then CDS tools display relative costs as well as relative radiation. It's not going to be specific. And to our point earlier, it's very hard to get specific with each patient because we don't know deductibles, co-pays, where they're at in that process, what's their co-insurance for certain services. And it saves time and reduces cost. Going to the next slide, please. So when we look at this workflow, of course, I use better images to make it nicer. But <laughs> it's much more simplistic than the one we looked at before because it is real time. So the provider orders the uh, exam or enters it into the clinical decision support tool. In this case, I mentioned one by ACR Select, so it's American College of Radiology. It provides a scoring, and it's usually a 1 through 9, or the tools may differ, and it has a green, yellow, and red showing that if you score a high score, meaning it's appropriate, you move right through the process, and it's, quote, approved by giving you a number to hand off to the next um, person in line so that they know it's gone through the appropriate process. If you get a low score in our marketplace, that ends up being a call to the radiologist. So our radiologists are on a phone from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. to answer those calls. So they can have a conversation. Why is my patient different? Why do I really think they still need the MRI? Let's talk about it. What do you know also about the, radiolog or about the patient? The radiologists in those regions typically have access to more information about that patient. They may have prior studies that they can go back to, and they can have a very, very good comprehensive conversation. That's something using a vendor we may or may not have because that history may not follow that patient. They may have changed insurance plan A to insurance plan B. So it's all really good things to keep in mind as we move forward. This com conversation between those radiologists and the ordering providers and how rich that experience can be and how much it can help that patient get really what they need so they're not paying for something that they don't. And it's a laser focus on appropriateness. You, in here, you don't see anything about cost. Yes, you'll have those conversations, but it's really saying we're going to do the right thing for the patient. And it's incorporating those choosing wisely approaches as well. So let's make sure that we're thinking about evidence-based medicine. What do we know is the best course of treatment for this particular patient? And let's follow it. Next slide, please. So what did our providers have to say? We did a pilot here on the small scale, really looking at could this tool really be used and could it be used in a way that people would use it on a daily basis and or was this something that they providers would use and say it doesn't work. What we found was it was very positive and the providers found both utility and sustainability, meaning if they had to change how they did their daily work, they were willing to do it because the tool provided them some type of assistance that they found value in, which was great. An example that we had in our pilot was we had a patient come in. Ultrasound and CT were recommended. The CT was more highly recommended. But in that conversation with the patient, that team, along with the radiologist, decided to follow the ultrasound approach. And that was really driven by not only convenience of where that could be delivered, but also the cost of that CT. And so they said, let's start with this. And if we can get our answer, great. And then we'll reserve the right to have to move forward if we, we can't get it. But let's start with this and see if we can't get as far as we need to. When we look at what we feedback we got back, and I won't go through all of these. You can read through it yourself. But I really want to point out a couple things. One of the most important pieces that I pulled out of this was the experience that was shared where the physician actually said, I feel like I have more confidence in my ordering. That meant that they were getting educated with the use of the tool. And they were willing to come out and say, you know, sometimes I need to pick up the phone. I need to understand. But using this tool gave them that confidence to know I'm on the right track and I am doing the right thing at the right time. And again, it's real time, it's educational, it's 
they preferred this over the prior authorization process, and again, it enhanced that communication and collaboration between providers. They felt that they had greater capacity to have discussions with the radiologist, as well as um, being able to share some of these findings with payers to say, isn't there a better way? Isn't there something else that we could be doing that doesn't have as much cost involved on all these sides of the equation that really gets us at what's important here, which is appropriateness of imaging orders. Um, we're using programs that are linked to CDS um, to do some additional choosing wisely initiatives within our group practice, which has been great, and working with the ACR to do that. Um, and we're preparing for use of clinical decision support because in January of uh, 2018, Medicare has chosen this approach over using a prior authorization approach uh, for imaging. And in particular, they are the first payer to come out and actually start using it in the emergency room department, meaning that those patients coming through the emergency room, if they're not a trauma patient or you know, life-threatened patient, will go through the use of the tool to make sure that that CT you're getting is the appropriate exam for that patient given their clinical conditions. And with that, I will turn it back over to Sarah. Thank you, Jennifer. So now I'd like to introduce our last speaker, uh, Andrea barondi kitts who will talk to us about how lack of transparency affects patients and how you can take action. Andrea? Thank you, Sarah. Um, now we're going to change an approach a little bit because you've heard all about the provider side and why we can't get the costs and uh, how hard it is to figure out what they are. I'm going to tell you what it really means from uh, the patient side, our side of the equation. Next slide. So this is a typical scenario to physician's visit. Um, you have an annual exam. The doctor says to you, I feel a nodule in your thyroid. You need an ultrasound. You're thinking, oh, I know 95% of thyroid nodules are benign. But you ask, how much is an ultrasound? The doctor says to you, it's not as expensive as an MRI. It's hundreds, not thousands of dollars. You're thinking, hundreds, thousands? You say, hey, doc, I have a high deductible. Do I really need this? Next slide. The doctor says, well, it's standard of care for palpable thyroid nodules. And you're thinking, well, my husband and my mom died of cancer. It's probably nothing, but I should check it out. So you say, OK, doc. Doc says, I'll order an ultrasound. He's thinking, I wish I could give her a better answer. You say, thank you, doc. And your thought is, I wonder how much all this is going to cost. I think we can all relate to this scenario, whether we are patients or even physicians. This actually happened to me. At my annual physical two years ago, my physician felt a nodule in my thyroid. The conversation is almost word for word the exchange we had. I know both of us were less than satisfied with the discussion of costs. I did get the ultrasound found out that I had multiple thyroid nodules, saw an endocrinologist, had a biopsy, luckily benign, and continue with regular ultrasound surveillance and endocrinologist visits. It has cost me thousands of dollars in out-of-pocket costs. The protocol for follow-up imaging I'm following meets NCCN guidelines, but I keep wondering if the annual follow-up imaging is really necessary. Would I have gotten that first ultrasound if I had known the extent of the follow-up costs? In my case, probably, but that not, might not be true for everybody. This is just one of the many scenarios that impact patients in trying to access the costs of care. Next slide, please. In the case of my late husband, Dan, he was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer in October 2011. He died 18 months later, and 18 months spent trying to find the best treatment options. Cost was seldom discussed except if it was a procedure that was not covered by Medicare. I think we encountered pretty much every scenario possible. One of the first was deniable, denial of coverage for a CT of the abdomen required by our clinical trial protocol. The oncologist had a peer-to-peer -peer discussion with the insurance company medical officer, and every CT abdomen thereafter required extra documentation for pre-op. We had to delay one of Dan's treatments due to slow pre op I kept wondering why the office staff didn't just submit the pre-auth request sooner. That's when I become aware, became aware of the narrow window for allowable pre-auth submittal. The coverage for costs for clinical trials is complicated. In most states, items that are considered standard of care are covered by insurance, even if provided within the context of a clinical trial. 
it is not always clear, however, what the standard of care is, so often patients are left with a hefty bill. Our oncologists and staff felt the CT abdomen was standard of care, and the insurance company did not agree without a lot of extra effort and documentation. When Dan tried erlotinib, a treatment in pill form instead of an infusion, the cost was astronomical. He went through the Medicare donut hole in one month. I had no idea of the difference in coverage between Medicare Part B and Part D until I went to pick up the medication at the pharmacy and the copay was several thousand dollars. The oncologist never mentioned the difference in coverage. Maybe he didn't know. Then we were surprised by the hefty copays required for each of Dan's 25 radiation oncology treatments. We found out when we got the bill. And all the other little surprises, the extra charge for getting an x-ray at the hospital the day after Dan had a small pneumothorax during a CT guided core biopsy. We had requested to do the x-ray at our local imaging site, but the hospital staff were insisted on using the hospital site. We soon figured out why when we got the bill. Overshadowing all of Dan's medical treatment was his feeling that he caused his own illness and did not deserve to complain about any of his symptoms or about the cost of treatment. The only costs he could control were his non-cancer medication costs, so he cut back on using his inhalers for his COPD from twice a day to once a day. The oncologist got very upset and gave Dan samples so he would adhere to his medication and reduce the risk of a COPD flare. And the best part was getting the small insurance adjustments to Dan's account months after he died. Most of the adjustments were less than $5. I just started ignoring these. Interestingly, this is the same strategy that Dan's sister used when she was undergoing treatment for lung cancer 11 years prior to Dan's diagnosis. When she died six months after her diagnosis, her son found all of the unopened medical bills piled up on the dining room table. And finally, some phys physicians think they are aware of costs. In interviewing orthopedic surgeons for my recent hip replacement surgery, when I mentioned that I wanted a ceramic femur ball for my prosthesis due to my metal allergy, the surgeon said those were more expensive. I indicated I was willing to pay the extra cost. He replied, well, the insurance will pay the cost, not you. I commented that with my high deductible individual health insurance, I would be paying. He said he didn't know anything about that, seems he was interested in the health care provider side of costs, not the patient impact. Next slide. Now I'm going to switch uh, gears a little bit. Um, I'm really excited to tell you about a new initiative between the Journal of the American College of Radiology and the American College of Radiology. Those of you that are radiologists are probably aware of the appropriateness criteria articles, usually referred to as ACs. For those that aren't, ACs are guidelines on imaging tests and treatments for specific medical conditions. They are based on evidence that show it works. A panel of experts developed the guidelines for what imaging tests physicians should order for different patient symptoms, medical histories, and health status. The guidelines are reviewed every year by an expert panel of people in different medical specialties. The development and annual review of the guidelines includes a review of the latest research and the use of well-established criteria to determine the right imaging tests and treatments for different medical conditions and course of events. If there is no evidence or the evidence for the tre right treatment or imaging test is not clear, expert opinions are used to develop the guidelines. Currently, there's 230 ACs. I became aware of these when I got my September 2016 issue of JACR and read the AC on low back pain. Serendipitously, I had just gotten imaging for my back pain, so I wanted to see if my PCP had followed the guidelines. He had. As I was reading the article, I thought it would be great if the AC had a layperson summary to help patients understand what tests are appropriate for their situation and to help ordering physicians and radiologists explain the reason for a particular imaging test to their patients. I proposed the idea to my editor, Bruce Hillman. Bruce was supportive and I drafted a layperson abstract for the low back pain AC as an example. After a lot of discussion and reviews, we are launching the project. We are looking for patients and patient advocates who are interested in helping us write 250-word layperson abstracts for the 230 ACs. We're offering a $100 honorarium for each completed abstract. Full attribution will be given to the patient author for the abstract, and the abstracts are going to be published online, and each AC will have a link to the layperson abstract. The abstracts will be citable. Please contact me if you're interested in helping with this exciting project.
Next chart. I also want to make everyone aware of a great resource for patients and physicians, radiologyinfo.org. Despite my husband having many imaging tests, CT scans, MRIs, CT guided biopsies, ultrasounds, and x-rays during his lung cancer journey, and my recent status as an imaging test frequent flyer, I had not encountered this site during my frequent Google searches. Bruce Hillman made me aware of this site during conversation when I mentioned the need for radiology information for patients. I quickly che checked it out and suggested we find a way to raise awareness of this source for patients. So please help spread the word. Go out there and check it out. Although the site doesn't include cost information, it does include information on different imaging tests, what they're used for, the procedure for the test, including any preparation required, and the risks and benefits of the test. For tests that use ionizing radiation, the radiation dose is discussed. It's a great place for patients to get information and to prepare them for discussions with their physicians. And the site's also available in Spanish. Two other good reference sites are imagewisely.org and imagegently.org. Both of these sites have information about the safety of imaging tests with ionizing radiation, as well as providing information for radiologists on how to minimize the radiation dose in imaging tests. The Imaging Wisely site is for adults, and the Image Gently is for children. I found a great template on the Image Wisely site for tracking imaging studies. I can't help myself from providing an improvement suggestion for the template, as it does not include a place to track radiation exposure. I would recommend adding that. Both of these sites also include links to reference materials and reference uh, websites. These are all great resources for radiologists and patients. I would ask everyone on this webinar to help us raise awareness about these sites. Next slide. Now, Matt Hawkins shared a great article on what's happening and how we're going to take a look at cost effectiveness in health and medicine and ways to include some of the uh, non-healthcare related costs. I have some uh, suggestions about this, some comments from a patient perspective, but Matt, why don't you tell us what the, what the paper is? Yeah, no, this, uh, thanks Andrea. What, what is exciting about this just came out in JAMA 2016. You know, everything we've been talking about is why is it important to, to have these conversations Patients, what information can we arm our patients and physicians with to have them have, have, have better conversations centered around cost? Um, and so the second panel on cost effectiveness in health and medicine just recently released their recommendations on how to actually do cost effectiveness research uh, in healthcare and kind of showed that out of prior research going back to, to the mid 90s uh, and really through 2011, 2013, uh, only 29% of all um, cost effectiveness analyses in healthcare uh, included or adopted a societal perspective. And so what do I mean by that? Uh, that's talking about considering the cost of time off of work, the time for recovery, uh, the, the impact on uh, lost productivity in the workforce, the impact on education for, for younger patients or people uh, missing, missing school. And so the fact that less than 30% of our cost effectiveness research actually included that as a little bit of a tragedy, but importantly for patients moving forward, this is going to involve much more engagement uh, to really understand what those costs are. And, you know, certainly as an interventional radiologist, we're uh, extremely interested in this topic because most of what we do results in shorter recovery times and shorter hospital stays, uh, et cetera. So uh, it's certainly a call to action for health service researchers to do a better job in this realm, but also for patients to become increasingly engaged so we can accurately understand what the costs of what we do in healthcare are. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, it, it was a great article. I would recommend that everybody, if you have a chance to read it, you go ahead and read it. There was a, a table on there that talks about some of the uh, an inventory template to see what some of the different costs are that should be included. So they've got different sectors. So they have the health sector ones. And then they say, there's some health, non-health sector examples as well. And uh, social services was a big one that I thought should be included. Um, Matt talked about education, housing, the environment, you know, how, what are the impacts of environment. Uh, and productivity, of course. Um, the one that I really liked was um, the number of crimes related to the intervention. I'm not so sure we'll have too many of those. Um, but, but seriously, the, the only fault I really found um, with this article was that 
patients were not included in any of this. You know, we're talking about the impact on patients, but once again, you know, typical of most of these studies, um, patients were not there. So I would just like to say that future going forward, you know, patients need to be included. Um, we're going to get better recommendations. We'll get, um, we'll definitely get a much better product. So um, that's all I had. I think, uh, Sarah, I'm going to turn it back to you. I think questions and answers maybe. Yes, thank you. So I want to be respectful of everyone's time. First of all, thank you to all of our presenters. Um, we, if you have questions, keep them coming. Uh, we have time for one question, and then we will send out answers to the questions that have come in with the archived webinar along with the references. Um, and in addition, all the speaker contacts are listed here for your reference in case you'd like to connect with them directly. So here's a question for the group that came in, and then we'll, we'll wrap up the webinar. Um, the question is, as high deductible plans become mainstream, it seems as if lawsuits may increase as a result of decisions regarding appropriateness. Do you agree, disagree, what can be done to minimize that possibility? So this is about health decisions and the correlation with uh, high deductible plans. Uh, this is Jennifer. I can start the conversation. Um, I think when I look at it, I, I see that Right now, when decisions are made, um, again, we've got kind of some third parties involved with those decisions, and we don't always know what happens behind the scenes of that discussion. Using clinical decision support with the evidence behind it, and we can see directly how it links into those recommendations. If you're following those recommendations, that gives you the core evidence-based support in the case of something being contested. So you follow national guidelines, you follow the evidence that supports that decision, which I would think would um, be to a benefit in a, such a case or a liability case. I'd like to go ahead and, and, and chime in from a patient perspective. I would say what's most important there is that this be, even though there's clinical decision support and you're following the guidelines, um, I still think that there needs to be a discussion with the patient about patient values and preferences. Because regardless of, of the standard of care and following the guidelines, okay, what you need for a thyroid nodule is ultrasound, well, the patient might decide, hey, if there's only a 5% chance that it could be cancer, maybe I don't want to have that ultrasound. So you need to have the shared decision-making discussion as well as just the clinical decision support. Wonderful. Uh, any other comments? Okay, great. Um, so we will... Again, uh, there are other questions that did come in, and we'll circulate those along with uh, the archive of the webinar, as well as some of uh, the recommended resources that were also circulated through the chat functionality. I want to thank you for taking the time to log on to the Learning Exchange. I'd also like to thank our speakers for their enlightening presentations. They've given us a lot of information to think about and act upon. And uh, also want to thank the ACR for their hard work in helping us put together this, uh, this webinar, this exceptional webinar. So lastly, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, I encourage each and every one of you to submit your work, whether it's research, a thesis you're in the midst of, policy you're helping to advance, an online community you've created, or a best practice or hack you've uh, created as a participatory patient, caregiver, or clinician. If it falls under the umbrella of participatory medicine, we encourage you to share and become a contributor to the Learning Exchange. You can submit your work using the following link. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, and if you're not a member, we welcome you to join the Society at participatorymedicine.org. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our speakers. We hope you enjoy the rest of the day.